what? Let's just close our eyes for a minute. Let's get focused. <clears throat> let's just prepare our hearts right now. We've given, and now let's ask the Holy Spirit to give to us, and let's have a heart that's receptive. Father, we thank you for your word today. I pray, the Lord, that this word is revealed to us in a mighty way, that Holy Spirit, we choose to surrender to hear and listen. I pray for any person here whose ears or eyes are deaf and are blinded, that today, that Holy Spirit, that you draw, that you reveal and open ears and eyes to see and hear the word today. That, Lord, the things that have... Uh, happened in life that have been blinding us to see truth that today I, I pray that Lord that you just tear down those barriers those walls those curtains of separation and the Lord today that we'll see clearly we'll seek you and find you today I pray over myself I humble myself before you as a spokesman of your word today I declare I have the mind of Christ my tongue is anointed and the Lord I'll do everything rooted and grounded in love today that lord i will speak forth with boldness and power that lord that i will allow you to speak truth through me today let the seed of the word be planted in our hearts today we prepared the ground so it shall produce fruit and the birds will not come and steal it i declare that today lord that we are set free by your word in jesus name amen and amen all right, let's go ahead and just jump on in this thing. We're going to get back into Philippians chapter 3. I want to go back to Philippians. We were there last week. I want to give you a heads up. You can go ahead and turn there. Philippians chapter 3. We'll start in verse number 8. So last week we were in, our, in this series of restoration. We were talking uh, a little bit about FOMO. And so this week I'm going to kind of still talk a little bit about this scripture but I'm going to go in a little bit different direction on some things. This one I'm going to entitle, The Restraints of Restoration, My Dwelling. Say, My Dwelling. So Paul, last week, he's never really been shy about the fact is that he's been working through some issues in his life. And what I love about him is he's, he's not trying to hide it. And he's willing to allow God to do what he needs to do, the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit needs to do, and he's willing to receive the correction of the Spirit of God to make the changes needed in order to fulfill the purpose that God created him for. Right? He was never afraid of sharing some of the struggles and journeys that he's gone through in his life. Even the things that he was battling in his mind, he could even, you could even see where Paul was saying, listen, I haven't got it all figured out yet, but follow me as I follow Christ. Don't look at me in the flesh. Look at me at my purpose, what I'm created by the Spirit where God appointed me to because my flesh will let you down, but the Spirit of God in me will never fail. In Philippians chapter 3, we're going to jump back in this verse number 8, and I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Version today. So it may read a little bit different from whatever version you have if you don't have the Amplified Classic. But if you're getting a little comfortable with that, they're going to put it up on the screen for you. You can follow along. Verse number 8, Philippians 3. Yes, furthermore, I count everything as loss compared to the possession of the priceless privilege of the supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus. I went here and underlined in my Bible... I count everything as loss compared to the possession. I count everything as lost compared to the possession. The possession of what? Of knowing Christ. Not just receiving Him as Savior, but knowing Him as Lord. Knowing who Christ Jesus truly is and what that means to me. Here, he's saying, I, I'm counting everything else as non-comparable. That everything else falls under subcategories to this one thing in my life. And that's getting to know Jesus Christ. 
when he's using this term counted as lost, he doesn't mean that it's, it's just something that's so forbidden, but it means that nothing takes the place of. Nothing is going to take the place of this relationship with Christ. Nothing is going to come in front of this relationship. That everything that I possess, everything I choose in life, my life is submitted to this relationship of knowing Christ. See, there's nothing this world can offer that compares to what God has given us through Jesus. Paul's statement here shows that he had established a heart of surrender. Say a heart of surrender. I'm going to tell you, friend, one of the most difficult things for you and I to do is to establish a daily heart of surrender. It really is. Why? Because our heart, our, our flesh wants to live. Listen, you could, you could be born again, tongue talking, laying on hands, casting out devils, but you can also wake up on the wrong side of bed. That's how we call it, you know. God may say something different, but we have come up with the phrase, the wrong side of bed. It means that I got up with a bad attitude today. Am I the only one that's ever woke up with a bad attitude? And sometimes I've, I woke up with a good one, but it seems like an attitude woke up in me. Right? You know what I'm talking about. That's the flesh, right? So we still have to ensure that if our attitude tries to buck itself up, even though it might have a cause, I still say, you know what? I surrender it because it's not more important than the knowledge of Christ. I reverence the knowledge of Christ. We have to learn to honor and reverence the knowledge and the relationship, the revelation we have gained so far. Sometimes we don't honor that. We know to do right, and we do wrong. That's called dishonor. It's called sin, really, but it's a dishonor to the knowledge of knowing Him. Hello? And Paul said, there's nothing that can compare. Nothing. I count everything as loss. That means that I count my way, my feeling, my reaction, right? Come on, some of you know what I'm talking about. The way I want to do it, I count it as loss. Even though it's going to make me feel good. How much of the world today is living by feelings? Right? How much of the church today is living by feelings? We live by faith, not by feelings. Hello? So you have to count even your feelings as loss. Why? Because you don't want anything to interfere with the knowing of Christ. So let's read the priceless privilege and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And I underline this progressively becoming. Say progressively becoming. You know, like pastor, you talk a whole lot about progression. Yeah, because I'm going to tell you what, if it hadn't been for progressive growth. I would have been damned to hell. I would have just been if there was no grace to give me progressive growth. I would not be where I'm at today. So I will preach progression because so many people do not. Because so many people beat themselves up because they're not where they think they should be. Or they're, they, they're not where somebody else is that they're comparing themselves to be. Don't compare yourself to me. And don't compare yourself to any other person. Who you compare yourself with is what you say is, am I conforming to Christ and if I don't see it then I say God what can we work on today to get me one step closer to looking like you what are you willing to lose today so that you can gain in your relationship today so it says and progressively becoming 
more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. I underline acquainted with him. And that means perceiving and recognizing and understanding him. And I underline this last part in the Amplified fully and clearly. So I'm pro progressively becoming acquainted with him fully and clearly. I count everything as loss in this world. Nothing is higher in my life in authority than the relationship I have with Christ. And why do I do that? Because I'm progressively becoming acquainted with him fully and clearly. When the things of the world, when our flesh is not counted as loss, it muddies the water. You will begin to see things more dimly and dimly and dimly. But the closer you get in this relationship, the progressive walk, things will become more clear. You'll begin to get more acquainted with him. So you can fully understand and know. Why? Because the mud of the flesh is being removed from the eyes of your life. There is a progression of clarity that comes when we spend time with the Holy Spirit. He reveals the fullness of Christ. You will not know the fullness of Christ without the Holy Spirit. You can read your Bible front to back, every book that every Christian author comes out with, and you still won't have an understanding. You can have all the head knowledge about it you want, but you still won't have the understanding. The applied knowledge where it is working in your life. It's not about how much you can read. It's how much you can surrender. So reading becomes beneficial in your life. You want the word to benefit you more than ever? Ask the Holy Spirit. To show up in your reading time. Yes. Yes. Not you're having to do a devotion time where you've got a calendar set up and, and you can click off on your app to show people, look what I did. Yeah. That's religion. Yeah. That's a form of religion. You don't realize it's a form of religion that we're doing something so God will do something. Something so I can do this. Something I can do this. And it's a, a work-oriented way. But I'm telling you when you, get into, when you get into this relationship You start to begin to pray and seek And spend time with the Holy Spirit And the Holy Spirit is going to always lead you back To the word If you're in prayer And you're never being led back to the word You're just, you just, you just bumping your gums Your prayer True prayer When it becomes less about you and more about the spirit and more about the kingdom and more about others. Yeah. He's going to lead you to that B-I-B-L-E. Yeah. And when he leads you there, it's going to become life to you. Yeah. Because the thing you read a million times in every author, you'll go, that's what it meant. <gasps> and you finally can apply it to where it's producing in your life. I've seen a lot of people that can quote the Bible. That ain't worth two cents when it comes to trusting and knowing God right. or being a person of character and integrity. Right. You will not impress me with your knowledge of a Bible. Right. You won't do it. I'm not the guy. Why? Because I've seen a lot. Yeah. You will not impress me because a, a miracle happens when you show up. Because I've seen a lot. What will impress me is, is when everything else and everybody's gone and I look and I see and your life is holy unto God that you reverence him in everything that you do. Character and integrity. Character and integrity. Never follow somebody because of their knowledge, because they can quote, or follow because they can lay hands and heal. You always look at the fruit and the character. Yeah, right. 
They may not, they may not be the, the most flashiest person. They may not have the biggest miracles. But if they can show they have the biggest heart, you stick with them. You stick with them. Because that's when you're going to change. Are you listening to me? I'm just sharing that with you. Just because it's some big and flashy doesn't mean, doesn't mean that it is of God. Our flesh, that sin nature, will always blind us from seeing fully and clearly who God is and what his desire is for our life. Reading on. For his sake we have lost everything. Is this New Testament? Real, is this New Testament? How many believe that Paul was a man of faith? Right? How many believe that Paul was a man that was empowered by the Holy Spirit? Do, do you believe Paul didn't believe that God wanted him to prosper? Right? But here he's talking about even for the sake of the gospel. He said, I lost everything and consider it all to be mere rubbish. Yeah. Right? In order that I gain Christ, the anointed one. Yeah. And automatically we're like, well, I guess I got to give the house away. Yeah. That's not what he's talking about. Yeah. Well, I guess I got to give the money away. Clear the bank accounts out because that's holding me from not seeing Jesus. Yeah. Will a minister try to twist that and use that to do that to you? Absolutely. But that's not what he's talking about. He's saying everything that I used to hold value to in my life, I've lost it. I've given it up. Why? Because I want to know Christ. I want to gain the knowledge of Christ, the anointed one. He's born again, right? Here he is, right? I'm talking about he's a follower of Christ. Holy Spirit indwelling in him, right? This is, this is Paul we're talking about. Am I right? Then why is he talking about gaining Christ? He's already got him. How do I gain him? You gain in the knowledge and clarity of who he is yeah. to you. Right. Yeah. Never Stop pursuing knowing Jesus. Amen. Never stop the pursuit. Never stop the pursuit. There is nothing in this world that is worth missing what God has provided for you. We talked about FOMO last week. Remember that? I introduced that word to you if you didn't know it. Fear of missing out. What are we afraid of missing? I had a little FOMO this morning, so I went to Goodwill, I'm going to be honest with you. I wanted to see what they had. I could have stayed home and got just the same amount of what I got there. I didn't get anything. But I was excited to go. Why? I wasted a lot of energy to go for no reason. How much energy, how much of our time is wasted, and we really are gaining nothing but a little experience that tickled the flesh desire yeah. Yeah. because we're afraid we're going to miss out on something. Yeah. There's nothing that this world can offer us that is more valuable than what God is willing to provide and pour out into our life. The question I asked, the thought-provoking question last week was this, what has become more valuable than God in my life? And if I can answer that question, then I need to attack that idol and say, you, I'll count you as loss. You don't matter that much to me anymore. If God told me to get rid of you, you got to go. I'm not talking about husbands and wives here. Don't get the word twisted. You look at him and say, I told you, sucker. This is confirmation. No, this is not confirmation. No, no, no. 
Let's read on. For his sake, I have lost everything and consider it all to be mere rubbish in order that I may win. I understand, I, I, I underline this, I have lost, and then I jump down and underline that I may win. I have lost, therefore, that I may win. Here's another, remember the other week, a few weeks ago, I talked about kingdom principles that were totally opposite of what the flesh wants or that what we comprehend with our head. Here's another one right here that's totally opposite. In order to win, you have to be willing to lose. In order to win, you have to be willing to lose. There is never and there never will be victory in the kingdom of God outside of surrender. There is never victory. You'll never have victory in your life over the obstacles that the enemy puts in front of you outside of surrender. Not true victory. You maybe can pacify it for a minute, but it will always show back up. You'll never be victorious until you first are surrendering it to God. If you want to win, you have to be willing to lose. That's crazy. In our eyes is the world, right? Yeah. I could, can you imagine us going to the, the football team? All right, guys, here we go. We're at the national championship here. How many of you are going to just trust me here? We fought a long way. Undefeated. We're here. This is going to be the trophy time. You've been waiting your whole life for this. Are you willing to lose? That's not going to be the motivational speech that they want to hear. Right? We're going to win. We're going to do it. But God's saying, hey. Are you willing to lose it? Are you willing to give up that little thing for something greater? What if you were your prize, your earthly prize, this little trophy you're trying to win that's so valuable to you? If you were willing to say, God, I'm willing to lose that trophy so I could gain the true reward. What trophies in our life that we're trying to gain that's costing us the reward God's trying to release? Verse number nine. And that I may actually be found as in him. I underline that. That, that hit me. That I may actually be found as known as in him and not having any self-achieved righteousness that can be called my own. Based on my obedience to the law's demands, ritualistic uprighteousness and opposed right standing with God's thus acquired. There is a difference between knowing the general area of something and actually tracking something to where you know it is every movement and location that it is. This verse, I underline it, that I may actually be found. That I may actually be found as known. As in him. See, when we do it on our own in our flesh, we're just a blimp on the radar. But when we do it by the Spirit, there's a tracker on us. Let me give you a little example. I've worked a lot this week. I have spent many an hour building automotives for people all across the land. And I think this week we've done about 72 hours. There's Some of my guys are working today. But we're really trying to get this stuff out for our customers. And uh, so I've been working 12-hour days. 
getting there at 5 in the morning, leaving at 5.30 in, in the evening. Monday, I was there at 9 in the morning, left at 9 at night. So really doing all this stuff, and, you know, that, that overtime's good, right? I mean, it's, financially, it's good. I mean, it ain't, it ain't hurting my feelings with the money. It just hurts my feelings with my sleep. <laughs> so it's, we had to work yesterday. I was work yesterday. I got off about 5, 5, 15, 5, 30. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go stop by Walmart. I don't want to see. I'm a toy collector. I like vintage toys. I like different figures. I'm, I'm going to go see what they got today. So I decided instead of just going straight. Actually, I got off at 5. I usually get 5.30. I said, go, instead of going straight home, I'm just going to stop by. And then I'm going to head on to the house. Right? I'll get there the same time. So I pull off the valley exit, and I just pull right, I pull right into Walmart parking lot. And while I'm sitting in Walmart parking lot putting it in gear, I get a text. While you're there, <laughs> will you pick up some tennis balls? I said, look at this. My, my, my text back is, are you tracking me? <laughs> and you know what the reply was? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> I mean, all week I've been going straight home. The one day I decide to go to Walmart, I'm busted. <laughs> I'm busted. We, in our relationship, let me explain this to you. She doesn't do that, me not knowing. Sometimes I forget. But you might think this is crazy. You can say, this is, this is controlling, this is overprotective. Yeah, I'm overprotective of our relationship. She knows where I'm at. She can always look and find out where John Brogdon is. Why? Because I ain't got nowhere to hide where I'm at. If you're not willing to share your location with your spouse, you've got some shady stuff going on. That's none of her business. Yeah, you're one. That is her business. And ladies, that's his business. Not to control you, but it's to hold you accountable because sometimes you can't control yourself. My children, we know where they are. Why? Because I want to control them? No, I want to protect them. I want to know where you are. Amen. And so if I can give some advice to, you know, this is free, to some of you young couples, some of you married couples, don't feel like they don't trust you because they want to know where you are. Amen. Are you listening? Amen. Share with each other. Don't, be, don't hide stuff like that. It opens the door for the enemy. Right. Even though you may know that they would never do it, the enemy will plant seeds of question. What are they doing? He's done it with us. What are they doing? As long as we've been together, as long as we know we love each other, we don't want nobody else. He'd still be like, what, what you doing over there with them? You receive that from me? It's just wisdom. I'm telling you, just wisdom. Now, you don't have to do it. You live the way you want to be. But when you come for counseling, I'm going to ask you that first question. And I'm going to say, okay, if you wouldn't listen to me then, are you going to listen to me now? Okay? Just, but anyway, back to what it was. Let me get off of that. So I pull up at Walmart, and there it is. Will you pick up tennis balls while you're there? I'm like, this lady. What are the odds the one day that I pull up in Walmart, she, she's tracking me today, find out where I'm at? I said, my goodness. I so, You know what my re re response was? You ready, guys? Yes, dear. <laughs> sure will. I got you covered. How many do you need? And so there's your tennis balls that, uh, in LinkedIn that you got today. I was tracked, and those, you had a tracking number on your tennis ball, right? But, see, there's a difference between just popping up on a radar. It's called a blip, right? And sometimes things will appear and disappear. They'll appear on a radar, and they'll disappear. So then e even in navigation, when a, a person is navigating on water or in the air, the radar is always searching, looking for identifiable or unidentifiable aircraft, 
or vessels. Right? right? And so it's always looking. And then when there's a blip, there is a, hey, we need to reach out right here. We got something on the radar. Okay? But if it disappears, they don't know where it's at. But they're looking for the reappearance. Right? They're wanting to know. Why? Because they know something is out there that they need to get information so that they can succeed to their destination. That's what traffic control is for. It's, it's not to control them. It's for their safety so they can get where they need to get in their destination. Right? And back in this verse, it says that I may actually be found as known in him. Not just appearing every once in a while on the radar. And that's the statement. There's, there's a difference within than, than generalized knowing or a generalized area something actually, than actually something tracking something where it goes. I don't want to just be a blip on the restoration radar. I want to have a tracker on me so wherever I am, restoration follows me. Wherever I go, restoration follows me. Why? Because I'm actually known as in him. You, are you getting this? See, not, not just known about that I'm in and out of this relationship. I popped up. Here I am. Oh, there's a sighting. Okay, let's go. And before it can get released, I'm off the radar again. It's inconsistency in our relationship. And hey, listen, I believe everybody in this place can say that, that we've all been guilty with inconsistency at some level or point or time in this relationship with God. Let's be honest, brother and sister Jesus up in here. Right? But what happens is, is we show back up on the radar, and then when we get our flesh involved, we pop right back off. What we've done is, is now it's searching again for the release in your life when you pop back up as actually being in Him. I don't want to just be a blip. Put a tracking device on me. So wherever I'm at, my blessings know where to find me. The favor knows where to find me. See, the Bible gives different examples of when God searched the earth looking for a man that he could trust. Yes. Yes. He's always looking. Yes. His radar is always on. Yes. But have you got your tracker on? Yes. Yes. How do I turn it on? Get in him. Amen. That's why Paul's like, I counted all his loss. Yes. I, I, there's nothing wor worth me getting off radar. There's nothing worth me turning the tracker off. Yeah. Why? Because when, he, he, when the, the Father is pouring restoration in me, I can now walk in my purpose, in my created purpose. Yeah. That even though I failed in the past, even though I've done some things that I've just regret, even though people right now are rejecting me and trying to imprison me, the same thing I did is happening to me. But God yeah. has still got His tracker on me. Right in the middle of the prison. That's why he could still have peace in prison. He didn't want to be there. If you look at his letters, he's saying, I'm, I, I pray that I'll be coming to see you soon. Did he or did he not? That tells me that he didn't have a true knowing. Am I, supposed to, am I going to stay here or am I going to be released? But he was willing to say, no matter where I'm at, I know I'm on God's radar. He's tracked me. I'm here. And that's why he began to still influence people's lives in the middle of a physical prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And most of the church that we have today is influenced. Right now, we're being influenced from a man's writing while he was in prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a result of an, in, an inmate's penmanship. Yeah, yeah. But what if he had given up because of his circumstance? What if he said, God, I'm done with this, and he popped off the radar? How many lives would have never been impacted the way he impacted us today? How many people are not being impacted 
Because you and I are choosing to allow our jail, our situation, our issue to get us to stop being known as in him. Popping off the radar. Oh, y'all, y'all ain't getting me today. See, when the Lord showed me this this morning, I said, mm-hmm. You want to know where I'm at. When he went in the garden and they were running from sin, hey, where are you? They popped off the radar, didn't they? And from that point, he constantly said, I'm going to get that tracker back on you. Why? So that your purpose can be released. I know, baby. That's the cutest thing. I don't care what you, you, you cry all you want to. Yeah, I felt the same way. <laughs> I don't want restoration. Oh, 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 oh. Listen to this. I don't want restoration to just find me. <laughs> I, I want it to follow me. I don't want to just be found. I want to be known as that's where I dwell. That's where I'm dwelling. That's where I'm dwelling. The restraints of your restoration can be because of where you're dwelling, where you're residing, where you're being known as in or where you're not known as. Wow. I said, wow. Where are we dwelling? Where are we dwelling? If I don't stop right here, I know it's just, I got nine minutes, but if I don't pause, I can't get to my next point in time. And I'm not going to beat a dead horse today. Because I think right there you can stop and see. Man, and ask the question, where am I living? Where am I residing? Some of you use God as your summer house. But your residence is outside. When you want to go have fun, when you want to go find some help, some relaxation, some rest, you run to the summer house. Huh? When you just want to rub your feet in the sand for a minute because out there it feels like the world's coming. I mean, you know, that's what vacation is, right? You're getting away from the, the real just so you can just breathe for the moment. Right? Isn't that what it is? You go to the beach to do what? Relax. Go to the mountains to what? Relax. We go to the lake. We relax them. Why? We're saying, man, I'm so wound up, I just need to get away. And what happens is a lot of time we're residing in the things of the world being run by our flesh that the only time we're found in God is, is in the moments of trouble. When the pressure is too hard, when we feel like life has just gone crazy and wild, and what we do is we come and we run to be seen and known in Him. And then what happens is we come and then our vacation is over with. Why? We feel like, all right, we're rested. And then we're going to head back to the old house. Your blessings are never going to follow you where you used to live. They're not poured out in who you used to be. They're poured out when you reside in Him. When the summer house is no longer the summer house, it is the house. It's my residence. This is where I dwell. This is where I live. People come by, they may be tourists in that moment, and they look at you and say, Oh, how long you, how long you staying? No, I'm a local. I live here. You, you go to these towns, we, we go to a lot of beach towns, we go down to Gulf Shores, we go down to Panama City, Destin, 
We go to these places. Any place you go, you can go to Orlando. You go to, to that area and where there's a lot of tourists and the locals can pick you out. Right? There are people who actually live there. Not just visit there. There are local spots that the locals don't tell you about because they don't want to see you there. They're just there at the local spot. There are. We have good friends that live locally down by Gulf Shores, and they tell us the spots that the tourists don't go. Here, if you want the real, here's where you go. Right? So you may just be on on tour right now, visiting on vacation with God in here, but here I'm, I'm, I'm inviting you to change your residency. Become a local. We got some great spots that nobody else knows. A tourist is not going to go there. It's a little off the beaten path. It's a little deeper in. But I'm telling you, that's the freshest. You're not going to have to live off of the leftovers. You can go in and dwell somewhere where the locals go, and then you're going to find a residence. You're going to find people that encourage you. See, they start to know each other. Right? I mean, you know, when you go and you don't know nobody as a tourist, you could care how you act. You know, you care less. You're like, I ain't going to ever see you again. <laughs> That's why you see big people out on the beach. Not, you know, they still, they, man, they proud of themselves. Why? I ain't worried about you seeing me no more. You see me right now. Boom, boom, boom. You're like, why are you wearing that? <laughs> Stop! I'm big so I can tell you. I cover it up because I don't, I don't want everybody to know or see. Some folks, man, just... And some people just act in your way. Right? Why? They never see me again. But when you know people. Yeah. Right? That's why these big churches, a lot of people go, they don't know see me no more right now. I can act any old way I want to. But when you go to the local, Frank, why you been acting so crazy out there? You done got on that wacky tobacco or something? What's going on with you? You done messed up with the kids and got hopped up on something? You need to stop. You're too old for that. They're going to hold them accountable. Why? They lift them. There's your local assembly. Not to hurt you. You say, hey, what's going on with that? You done lost your way? Why are they moving trucks outside of your house? Where are you going? Um, I'm moving back over there where I, you know, where I came from. That's where I grew up. Why? Well, you know, I got a lot of old friends back there and family that lives there. So we're just going to get back to going, you know, back to normal. I don't have nothing to go back to. My FOMO ain't there because I ain't nothing there. It ain't nothing there. Because I remember when I came to the place of brokenness. I came to God and said, I'm broken. I need a new place to live. Because I'm dying here. Dying here. I'm asking you to become a permanent residence in Him. It's going to benefit. There's so much benefits to the permanent residence. way outlasts the visitor. See, they become a blip. But I want to be tracked. Where are you dwelling? Are the restrictions to your restoration because of where you're dwelling? It's a good question. Say it's time to move. See, God ain't beating you where you're dwelling at. He's not beating you because that the devil's beating you up. But see, when you come into the kingdom, you come into a new set of community rules. Well, he can't come in and do what he wants to. We got community rules here. Devil, you can't come trash up my yard and just act like nothing's going to happen. You can't. I'm in a gated community.
How many you know a gated community can still break in? You can spot them when they know you're not supposed to be there. Right? Yeah, I live in a gated community. Pearly gates. Don't come up here messing up our streets. They gold. See, he went and prepared a house for you. What's a house? What are you talking about? He's got a, and it's not just any house. He said, I've got a mansion. Remember, the more you surrender, the more square footage you have. What he's saying is, I'm preparing a place for dwelling. How much, how much of room do you want? Tell me what you need, because I'm building a place. I'm preparing a place. Preparing a place for for release of the restoration in your life. Tell the devil, you ain't got no, hey, you do not belong here. You had a residency here before you got kicked out. Do not enter again. You're trespassing. Move. Get off my lawn. Get off my family. Where are you living? Oh, we're back over yonder in Egypt. Are we going to go over here to the promised land? Amen. Did you enjoy it? Is it good? Yeah. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, my wife told me I got to take her out to eat today, so y'all come on, let's go. Let's stand to our feet. I love you guys so much. Thank you for just giving, giving me your time for a minute there. I pray that it was worth your time. Amen. I know time is valuable. Okay, you can't get it back. So I'm not here to, to just mix up any old word and do something in here and there. I want something that benefits you. Amen? And that goes for anybody who's watching online as well. I appreciate you. Thank you for listening. Okay? But is it in one ear and out the other? Are we going to walk out this door, head to wherever we're going destination? I don't know where I'm headed yet. She's going to make the, that decision in a minute. Are we going to go about our life again? How many know vacations have good memories? Right? But you can't live in memories. So this right here, you might have some good memories of the chills you got here and the fun that we just, you know, the revelation. But you can't live here. You got to take it with you. You got to use this in your dwelling. Right? I don't want it in one ear and out the other because... It benefits you no, none at all. That's why you need to re-listen re to it, get in that word, say, Holy Spirit, okay, I saw some stuff through Pastor Day. Now I want some revelation in this. You were opening my eyes in service. Now now I want to open my eyes in private. See, that's what, the, that's what this does right here. See, when you get born-again believers in faith, the Holy Spirit will grant things to you, even though you don't deserve it. He will open up and reveal some things when it shouldn't have been revealed to you because of how you are, yeah. but because of the environment set by born-again believers who've been praying for you, the Holy Spirit and the grace allows your eyes to open and see things. That's why you can see some things here you never saw before, right? And then you leave out of here, and then you don't see it again. Right? It's because your relationship is dwelling in here. And we got to take here to there. Right? So where are we dwelling? And I, I, I get, watch it on YouTube. It's going to come out today. Right? If they recorded it on CD today, I don't know. They're hit or miss back there. I promise you, I don't know. But if they got it, they got it. Get it. Get the scriptures. Hopefully you got a notepad. You were writing some scriptures down. A U version. You don't have the U version app on your phone. Get it. They're going to put the notes up there for you. Hopefully they're not putting all my notes up there that I didn't go over because that 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 that, uh, that hurt my feelings. I got a lot more. But when, when the Holy Spirit says I'm learning to be more sensitive to that. Okay? Because he just told me, hey, done. Right? Done. I could preach for another two hours, I promise you. I'm, I'm, I can do it. 
But what are we going to do? That'd just be more stuff that maybe you're not going to go out there and, and study. Take what you got today. That spark that you got today. That jump in your spirit that you got to say, wow, I, I, I've been on vacation mode. I pop up on the blimp every once in a while. But I don't want to just pop up. I want to live there. I don't need him finding me. I need to be found in him. I don't need him having to look, searching for someone. I'm here. I'm in him. I'm actually known as in him. Depart from me, you wicker, your work, worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. I actually want to be found as known. So there's something about being known in him and something about just showing in vacation mode where you're not actually known in him. You can you need to pray about that for yourself. But I, I, I need to make sure that I'm not playing around. Amen. And that he's the God of convenience. And that all the Holy Spirit is, is the spirit of comfort. He does it, but he wants more than that. Amen. <clears throat> Amen? I told you I can keep going, so I'm going to stop. Let's just bow our heads. I know almost everybody here. I know everybody here, but I don't know you probably connecting online right now. Do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? Where are you dwelling right now? If you have never got a place in Him, today is your day. The Bible says it's very simple. You believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is the Savior, and that He's needed because you're a sinner, that He took your sin upon Him died on the cross, rose from the grave, and is now seated at the right hand of God. If in your heart right now you say, that is my Savior, I know it, I know it, but I need Him, and you've never accepted Him. And the next part is this, let's make that confession of faith out loud. So if that's you, I want you to repeat after me, and we're all going to do it together. Say this to me, say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you now as a sinner and I need a savior I recognize I acknowledge you Jesus Christ you're the son of God you are my savior and I'm asking you to be my Lord come into my heart make my life your life I receive you now from this day forward I'll live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If that's you, reach out to us right now. We want to reach back out to you. Let me pray for you here. Listen, you may have had a vacation home, but now it's time to buy it. Not just go there every once in a while, but it actually be yours to own that you live there. So I'm going to pray that every area of your life that has been a dwelling here and there, I'm going to pray that you will come and you'll dwell in him, that the restoration follow you and be poured out in your life. Let's just bow our heads. Father, I pray for every person here. I call them the head and not the tail, above and not beneath and more than conquerors. I pray that, Father, Lord, that they find themselves in you, that they're actually known in you. Holy Spirit, reveal areas that we need to work on. The areas of our life that we need change in. That are still living like we were back in the old residency. I don't want to be a blip and they don't want to either. I want you to track us. I want, Father, I declare that, that the restoration follow them wherever they go. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I declare that the head, not the tail, above and not beneath, and more than conquerors through Christ. Father, as they leave this place, I thank you, Lord. They're not going to just allow this seed not to be produced, but, Father, they're taking it with them wherever they go. 
In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. We'll see you guys next week.